Okay, uh, very welcome everyone to our next session, which is uh, the awarding of the 2022 André Mischke Young Academy of Europea Prize for Science and Policy, which will be given to Gary Toldi. And Gay Mudinos will give the loud out to you, please. Okay, welcome back from the break, everyone. Dear members of Academia Europea, dear fellows of the Young Academy of Europe, it is my great pleasure to present the Laudatio for the Young Academy of Europe Andre Mischke 2022 Prize for Science and Policy uh, to Dr. Gergay Toldi, Senior Lecturer in Neonatology at the University of Auckland in New Zealand, co-chair of the Widening European Participation Thematic Mission of the Academia Europea Budapest Knowledge Hub and member of the Hungarian Young Academy, which he helped set up. Having just completed my term yesterday as chair of the Young Academy of Europe, it makes me really happy to be able to present the 2022 YAE uh, Andrei Mischke Prize. I was brought into the YAE by Professor Nicole Grobert, and I was fortunate to meet Andrei Mischke at my first AGM in Budapest in 2017. The care and the passion that those and others, some of whom are here with us today, that those founding members of the Young Academy of Europe had put into making their vision for this Young Academy a reality, to create a platform for early career scholars to have a role in science policy was palpable, inspiring, and as you can see in the role in which I'm speaking to you today, it was also very contagious. This year, the sixth annual YE Prize, which was renamed as the Andre Mischke Prize to honor our founding chair, Andre Mischke, is awarded to Gergely Toldi in recognition of his outstanding achievements and contributions to science and academia, policy making, science communication, and the Young Academy's movement in Europe. I first met Gergely in one of the annual meetings of the European National Young Academies. Of course, as you would expect nowadays, this was online. And so I'm also delighted to have been able to meet him in person here in Barcelona. Since that first online meeting, we have coincided several times or other meetings, either with other young academies or brainstorming on how to help tackle the inequalities in research funding across Europe, and in particular, how these disadvantages affect researchers in EU 13 countries. In all our interactions, I've always found Gergely to be a generous colleague, knowledgeable and dedicated. He is an exceptional early career researcher who uniquely combines his clinical work in neonatal medicine with innov innovative research in immunology and the field of flow cytometry. Gergely has conducted his research in laboratories on different countries and continents across the world, being currently based in New Zealand, and so it makes us very happy to have him back uh, in Europe for Building Bridges 2022. What makes him also stand out is that he has been very actively involved in the Young Academies movement. For example, he played a key role in establishing the Hungarian Young Academy in 2019, he is co-chair alongside Professor Eva Kondoroshi of the Widening European Participation Thematic Mission of the Academia Europea Budapest Knowledge Hub. And he has been one of the founding delegates of the Young Academies Science Advice Structure, YASAS, by which European Young Academies are now a new pillar in SAPEA Plus for European Science Advice, with the YAE as its legal entity and also as the president. European research and academia is world leading and pushing the boundaries of knowledge. But we do have some problems, and one of them is that European funding for research and the opportunities that this brings to people and to societies is not equally distributed. This pervasive issue is an issue of all, it's not just an issue of the people who are based in certain geographical locations. So Gergé here is an example of someone who beats some of these odds and while moving countries and labs and expanding his career, he remains involved in bettering the situation of early career researchers by continue, continuing his dedication to his national young and senior academy and their visions. So this, along with his aforementioned outstanding scientific and clinical achievements, is an inspiration to young and established scholars alike, and therefore makes him the ideal recipient for this award. 
So please join me in welcoming Dr. Gege Toldi in receiving the 2022 YAE Andrew Mishka Prize for Science and Policy. If we can have the slides for Gage, please. I would like to thank the Young Academy of Europe for um, this prize, and um, it's, it's a great honor, um, and I'm very moved. Thank you very much. And um, first of all, I would like to take a moment um, to remember Andre, um, whom I didn't, unfortunately, um, uh, have the, the, the privilege to know in person. Uh, but of course, his legacy in research and policy um, is far-reaching in Europe and beyond. And Andre had uh, several collaborators in Hungary in uh, particle physics, uh, working together with young researchers and colleagues um, at the Wigner um, Institute of Particle Physics in Budapest. And um, so the, the fact that this prize is uh, named in his honor uh, makes me even prouder to receive it. So I'm a neonatologist. Um, I uh, primarily work um, in clinical medicine. And um, this specialty of medicine is um, going through a fascinating um, a development at a fascinating speed. The specialty itself is probably not older than 50 or 60 years as, as a separate entity. Um, and in that scope, um, survival rates of preterm babies, um, such as this little baby on the, on the picture that we look after, have uh, improved dramatically. Um, this little baby here is probably around 23, 24 uh, weeks of gestation. Um, and if you Google preterm baby or prematurity, you often find uh, images like this with, um, with a ring, uh, a wedding ring on, on the arm of the baby, indicating how tiny they are. And it's not just the fact that they are tiny, but also um, their, their organ systems are really um, uh, immature and, and work completely differently. So understanding um, these, these nuances are extremely important and research in this field is extremely important um, to improve their outcomes and, and the clinical care that we provide to these babies. And as I mentioned, um, a survival has, has um, certainly improved. Um, today's challenge is to improve long-term outcomes as well and the quality of life um, after this initial um, very risky period um, when these babies are born uh, and into uh, when they reach adulthood. So I'm currently based in uh, beautiful New Zealand and um, I work at the Liggins Institute of uh, the University of Auckland, um, which is um, a separate research institute focusing on uh, early life research um, right from conception throughout pregnancy into um, early childhood, um, but also um, throughout the whole lifespan, really. Um, and my um, sort of interest from the research point of view is immunology, um, so quite basic research. Um, and uh, it still links in with, uh, with clinical medicine and what I do uh, clinically. Um, in understanding how the immune system and the immune response develops in early life. And this is very important from a number of uh, point of views. First of all, um, we probably all know that infection is, is a great problem um, in these uh, young patients and in, in childhood, and not just in um, developing countries, but also in the developed world. We still lose, unfortunately, many babies due to infection and because they are not able to fight pathogens. But on the other hand, um, we also know that there are a lot of complications arising from prematurity that have a really strong inflammatory background. So it's, it's not just the fact that their immune system is immature or non-functional, um, because we can see that they can provoke um, very strong inflammatory responses that has an impact on the, the entire uh, life after this early period. 
So it's probably more of a matter of this regulation and how these immune responses are regulated in early life. So when it comes to regulation in the immune system, um, a particular uh, subset of lymphocytes, of T cells, is um, of um, um, extreme uh, relevance and importance. And these are uh, the regulatory T cells, or T-Rex for short. They are a subset of um, and the T helper cells. Um, but um, unlike uh, other helper cells, which uh, produce um, different types of cytokines, messenger molecules, um, to prompt uh, other immune cells to work, these, these cells, these guys have a suppressive role and a regulatory role. And so understanding how they evolve, how they work in early life, may help us um, work out therapeutic interventions and, and diagnostic tools to improve um, those, those outcomes uh, that relate to um, infections, inflammation, and immunology in preterm babies. One of our research interests is how external factors, such as the type of milk the babies receive, or um, the vaccinations they receive, or the medical care that we provide. So how do these all factors influence um, the immune response in early life? And in a recent study, um, we looked at the differences of um, uh, immune function development in the first three weeks of life in healthy term babies, so not, not the preterm babies that I showed you, but healthy term babies, uh, without any complications, having a completely normal course in the first three weeks. Um, but some of these babies were breastfed, um, only receiving breast milk, and some of these babies were formula fed and never received a drop of breast milk. Um, and first of all, we um, described how um, the number, how the proportion of regulatory T cells changes within this short period, within the first three weeks from birth at uh, three weeks of age. And we found that breastfed babies had nearly twice as many regulatory T cells in peripheral blood than formula fed babies. And this is, this is a very big difference. Of course, there is some uh, natural variation um, in older individuals between um, uh, Treg numbers, but uh, not as big as this. So this made us, of course, very curious. And we wanted to find out more about it. We wanted to see um, uh, whether this causes some functional changes as well. Um, the exciting thing about breast milk is that um, uh, we still find out uh, more and more things about its compo uh, composition um, almost on a daily basis. Um, we, of course, know that uh, it's got important uh, nutritional value. It's got fats, proteins, sugars, um, but several other molecules um, that um, that impact on, on the baby, and not just molecules, but also cells, maternal cells, and within that immune cells, which are recognized by the baby's immune system as foreign cells. Um, we call these non-inherited maternal antigens. And um, we wanted to know why um, uh, babies don't seem to provoke a response, an immunological response to being constantly um, exposed to these foreign antigens via receiving breast milk. So we also looked at the T cell proliferation response in these babies, um, co-culturing uh, their cells with maternal cells, maternal antigens. And what we found was that uh, by three weeks of age, there was a reduction in T cell proliferation if the baby was breastfed, whereas it remained at the same high level, uh, the same high level immune response was present towards maternal antigens when the baby didn't receive any breast milk. When we depleted uh, regulatory T cells from um, these experiments, um, uh, the, the reduction didn't, didn't occur even in breastfed babies. So there's a clear link with regulatory T cells and, and how the immune function is suppressed and regulated in this early stage of life. Um, we also looked at uh, the microbiome from stool samples at three weeks, and we found that short-chain fatty acid-producing uh, taxa, such as Bellinella and Gemella, were more abundant in breastfed babies. And we know that these short-chain fatty acids provide fuel for um, regulatory T cell development and function. So it kind of all pulls together nicely and, and gives, us a, gives us an idea of how breastfeeding 
makes a very significant difference in the function and the numbers of regulatory T cells in early life. And of course, um, as with uh, many other research topics, um, these findings provoke more and more questions. So we are kind of um, uh, still busy finding more, uh, finding out more about this. Uh, for example, to see um, what consequences this would have on later life, because we know from epidemiological studies that being breastfed is associated with better uh, outcomes, better immunological outcomes. Um, autoimmune diseases are less prevalent, allergies are less prevalent, even things like um, obesity. And we know that even for, for the breastfeeding mother, it has got very positive health impacts. Um, so this is what we are currently engaged with um, in um, New Zealand. And this, of course, is, um, is a, uh, a very interesting uh, topic for science communication as well. Um, so uh, with these results, I, I had the opportunity to, to promote uh, breastfeeding and the public health messages of, of the benefits of breastfeeding and, and allowing um, new mothers to understand a bit more about why we emphasize this so much. Um, so um, yeah, it wasn't just the Vanity Fair, it was all sorts of other media as well, but um, that was, that was a, a quite interesting um, experience as well too to be able to put through that message. I would also like to take a moment um, to uh, mention uh, my uh, activity with the Hungarian Young Academy. Um, as, as you heard, uh, this Young Academy um, is, is a relatively new one uh, and was officially launched a couple of years ago, but has been very active since and I think is a very exemplary um, Young Academy. And what we are particularly proud of, uh, besides all the activities, is that we have a very good uh, collaboration and a very good relationship with um, the senior academy, the uh, Hungarian Academy of Sciences. And of course, we share common goals and um, it's very nice to be able to collaborate with them. Um, so this is, this is an excellent um, uh, work from, from the leadership of, um, of um, uh, the Young Academy as well to, um, to, to, to bring up um, uh, the Young Academy to this level in just a few years time. In the second half of my talk, I would like to uh, address a little bit um, the risks uh, I currently see in the academic clinician career path. And um, this might sound like a very kind of specific, um, narrow niche, uh, but I think it has important implications. Um, and I think that um, the time to act is probably around now and, and things like um, the, the recent COVID pandemic certainly exposed some of the weaknesses of this, uh, of this career path that uh, need to be addressed sooner rather than later. Um, so of course, academic clinician or um, physician scientists, as um, some people call them, uh, have, have a bridge role between um, scientists and, and clinicians, uh, the, the research world and the clinical world. Um, and ideally, they have strong training elements in both uh, the art and science of medicine, so both clinical work and scientific work, research work. Um, and and this, is, this is an important point because, um, of course, um, this, is, this is a balance in a, in a very sensitive stage, um, uh, early stage of, of a career, um, where you have to put a lot of effort into training in two separate worlds. Um, these practitioners and these experts are very well placed to identify gaps in clinical care. Um, and as such, they are a, a very important um, and um, sought after resource, both for industry and policy as well. Um, so when we think about their training and, and this career path, um, I personally find it very important that uh, both policymakers and um, the industry um, take their part in um, the, the training of these um, experts and, and uh, these academic clinicians. One interesting thing is, um, is a twist around, around the, the thinking between the two words. And of course, as, um, as researchers, like any other researcher or scientist, um, we are inherently risk-taking. But this is the complete opposite of what we do for patients, which is trying to find the least uh, risky approach or at the least, uh, least risk when it comes to offering treatments, for example. 
Um, so this kind of dual mindset, um, I think, is, is an important element of, um, of training. Um, academic clinicians uh, these days take part in the whole continuum of translational medicine, right from uh, basic science research into uh, translation to community. Um, historically, there were um, uh, certain regions in the world where, where there was more emphasis on lab work and basic science work, such as um, in the US, for example. But these days, of course, um, this has opened up to the whole continuum. And so in terms of the um, domains of um, the Andrea Miske Prize, which are um, science policy, evidence-based policy, science communication, and young researchers, um, I'd like to talk a little bit more about young researchers. If we just think about the recent COVID pandemic, we probably don't um, need to go very far to, to see how important um, the contribution of these individuals were to, to science policy. So um, um, helping guiding governments and decision makers to, um, to make the right decisions. Um, also for evidence-based policy from the clinical point of view, when we we're faced with a completely new phenomenon. And in the first few months um, of um, the COVID outbreak, we didn't really have a good idea of how we're supposed to treat these patients. Um, and there was a lot of collaboration going on to create evidence-based treatment guidelines. And of course, this is a very time-consuming process um, and um, a very expensive process, which um, had to be narrowed down very significantly both in terms of time and uh, funding available um, to achieve the best uh, possible and to identify the best possible evidence. And of course, science communication is, um, is key uh, or was key in um, the COVID pandemic as well. Um, we know how, how, we, how important um, this was and, and how things could go the wrong direction if science communication wasn't um, done correctly or um, um, messages were not communicated in a clear fashion. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about obstacles that affect young researchers who want to um, go on to this career path of um, becoming an academic clinician or a physician scientist. Um, and um, there are quite a few, and um, this is, this is a subjective list um, and mostly arising from my experience from three different countries. Um, so I'm happy to go into discussions about this and, and um, happy to, um, are very open to, to hear um, other, others' uh, thoughts as well as about it. Um, as, as, as discussed, it is an in-between state and that doesn't only have positives. Unfortunately, it has negatives as well, particularly when it comes to employment issues, for example, and administration and bureaucracy, um, because uh, most of the time uh, clinical work is done in a hospital, normally a public hospital, um, but the research bit ties these researchers to a university. And so this kind of uh, dual um, affiliation can create uh, problems um, when it comes to administration. Um, this might be very blasé, but um, we can't really ignore financial compensation, um, particularly if um, a well-trained cl clinician has got the choice to uh, do research or to go to do more private work or work for industry. Um, of course, those salaries are not quite comparable. Another important thing is that clinical work normally has higher job satisfaction. Um, of course, we have set cases, but um, in, in general, um, your kind of investment into patient care returns much quicker than your investment into research. And um, I find that this is something that deters um, young uh, researchers or, or young professionals who may be interested in going down this route. And this, this has to be um, addressed appropriately, um, and of course, um, resilience, much resilience is needed. Uh, the lack of dedicated research time is, is of course always an issue, and um, of course patient care always comes first, um, but protected research time is, um, is, is, is really a must to, to be able to successfully um, do this dual job. Uh, and also, um, when it comes to training um, academic clinicians, 
there has to be a clear distinction between research projects and uh, quality improvement projects. Um, this, again, may, may be very straightforward when you think about it, but often in reality, um, there, is, um, there is a bit of a blur between the two. And um, many um, academic research trainings end up doing quality improvement projects um, rather than actual research. Uh, another issue is the lack of recognition of training time during grants and award applications. Um, I think this puts uh, these individuals into disadvantage. Um, so while, for example, um, care issues are, are recognized or um, military services recognized, which are you know, absolutely fine and, uh, and justified, but investing um, six to eight years into specialty training um, in order to become a well-trained clinician uh, at this very early stage of your career, uh, before, after, or during PhD, um, is not necessarily recognized, and I think that's 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 an important issue. Uh, by goal supervision, I mean that um, again, these these um, early career researchers are often asked to um, supervise students, uh, supervise projects. Um, but if they haven't got a university affiliation, then that supervision, that work put into um, supervision is, again, not recognized. Um, often the support systems um, from the institutions or from the government are inconsistent. There's a lack of uh, a lifelong career path. Um, one thing people tend to worry a lot about is uh, what will happen with, with the COVID service over the two years? Of course, COVID affected everyone very badly. And everyone had to move um, into home office mode and things like that. Uh, but many of these clinicians were actually pulled into clinical work, so they didn't really even have an opportunity to work on their research projects over those two years or two and a half years. And while they might get extensions on uh, grant submissions or report submissions, um, nobody really knows uh, what's going to happen on the long term, again, in a very sensitive period of their career. Mentoring would be very important, and I think this is tied in with the aging workforce and, and um, a pool of mentors that is being constantly depleted because of retirement. And finally, um, the, the international uh, uh, recognition and is, is an issue as well. The lack of acceptance and understanding of these international career paths by medical councils and licensing bodies, which makes um, movement even within Europe very difficult for these individuals from one country to the other. Um, so, with that, um, these these are just three kind of short suggestions on how this could be addressed. Uh, I think conceptualizing the training internationally would be quite important. Uh, and to, to standardize certain aspects of the career path. Of course, at the same time, we have to acknowledge that different specialties have different needs and, and there's no one size fits all uh, model. And finally, possibly the formation of an international academic clinician society, a training body or advocating body might be something to look at into the, uh, in the future to address these challenges. And with that, I will stop now and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Gergely. What an overview of all the different roles and your exciting research. So we have time for a quick question before we move on to the next uh, lecture. Yes, there's a question up here. Thank you. That was a fantastic th talk, thank you uh, very much. I'm Anna Kupswan from uh, the Young Academy of Europe, and um, you've, you've just opened a completely new can of worms here, haven't you, in terms of looking at uh, a totally different discipline. I, I was just wondering about what do you think is the value of not just promoting um, the sort of physician scientist, but also allied health professionals and uh, taking up research because they are like a huge workforce and um, probably a lot more patient contact and that might actually be more beneficial. And what are your thoughts on, on that? Um, thank you very much for pointing that out. I completely agree and do please do excuse my ignorance. 
uh, which was completely unintentional. But of course, um, um, this, most, most of these things that I've been talking about um, are absolutely valid for nurses, uh, midwives, physiotherapists, and so on. And in those um, fields, on, in those um, disciplines, um, we probably even have a, a, an even more severe lack of individuals who are duly trained and who would engage with research. And um, and yes, um, some some of those some of those um, specialists and experts are such a sort of a rare resource from the workforce point of view that um, again they they find it really hard to to have dedicated time for their for their research projects. So thank you for raising that. Great, thank you, Anna. We have one more question from Ricard. Okay, <clears throat> it's not a uh, comment. It was very interesting the microbiological aspect that you mentioned, which is really just updating this. For many years, uh, we taught in microbiology that the first contact of uh, the baby with uh, with microbes is through the vagina. So they can, uh, and so different uh, composition of the microbiota. If uh, one uh, one baby is born by C C section cesarean or by the natural uh, part, this is one thing. But the other thing we we learned for the the last two years is that in, in, even in the placenta size of the baby, so it's they are colonization of a few bacteria, which is very important. So microbes are with us forever. Thank you for the explanation with the difference. Of Thank you. I didn't mention this, but this cohort of babies that we studied were actually all born from cesarean sections. Um, so one of the next things we are looking at is exactly the, the impact of uh, normal delivery, vaginal delivery, um, on, the, on the composition of the microbiome and through that on the immune function. Um, there is a lot of debate still about whether the environment in the womb is sterile or not. Um, I, think, I think the current understanding is that it is supposed to be sterile, but um, in most of the cases it is not. And this doesn't necessarily lead to pathologies or doesn't necessarily make the baby sick at birth, but it could certainly have an impact on all these things relating to the immune function. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, everyone, for your attention. So we move on now to um, the 2022 Academia Europea Gold Award, which will be um, a, awarded to seared clothing. Before uh, leaving the room for the um, Laudatio, I'd like to tell you a little bit about this award. This award is rarely given. It was first made in 1997. It's a non-monetary award to an individual or an organization following a direct nomination from the membership or on a proposal of the trustees themselves. The award is in the gift of the body of trustees. The gold award is a recognition of the significant contribution and impact made by the individual or organization to the support and development of European science through inspiration, public support, management expertise, or by financial means. It's not granted in recognition of scholarship. The medalist is invited to receive the medal and citation at an annual conference of members and is invited to deliver a lecture during the meeting. So on behalf of the trustees, I'm honored now to invite Dr. Robert John Smith, president of Eindhoven University of Technology, a former director general of research at the European Commission, and himself a recipient of the Academia Europea Gold Award to give the laudation. Please. Well, it's for me an honor and a pleasure to deliver the laudatio Professor Kluting's Gold Medal Award. I've worked with Professor Kluting for many years in my capacity as director 
and Director General at DG Research and Innovation at the European Commission. I worked with Professor Kluting when he was the Vice President of the ERC, the President of COST, and later on when he became the President of Academia Europea. And during those years, he impressed me not only with his outstanding academic career and in-depth knowledge of the academic system, but also for its leadership of prestigious European scientific institutions, his ability to deal with complex matters and his great diplomatic skills. Furthermore, at numerous occasions, SEED has demonstrated to be a strong supporter of the European values of cooperation and mutual respect. And he never shied away from defending those publicly. For this reason, Professor Kluting is for me the personification of the scholar diplomat, a first class scientist with impressive diplomatic skills. Professor Kluting's academic track record is outstanding. Over 300 highly cited papers in international peer reviewed journals and the promoter of many international PhD students. He served on numerous international committees, seven years, 2009-2016, in the Scientific Council of the ERC, including a term as vice president. And during those years, he optimized the grant system of the ERC by redesigning the starting grants and consolidating grants. And as chair of the ERC Working Group for Innovation and Relations with Industry, he successfully developed the proof of concept POC grants, allowing the results of the ERC funded research to find their ways to its application. CIT was strongly committed to enhancing the access of researchers from less research intensive countries to the ERC grant schemes. In addition, he served on behalf of the Scientific Council in the steering committee of the executive agency of the ERC, which I had the pleasure of sharing for many years. SEED also headed an ad hoc evaluation panel of the prestigious ERC Synergy Grants, resulting in the prolongation of the scheme. So it is fair to say that Professor Kluting has played a key role in making the ERC to what it is today, the most impressive initiative of frontier research at global level. Professor Kluting served as president of COST Association from 2016-2018 where he demonstrated exemplary leadership by defining a strategy that positioned cost at the heart of the European research area. This strategy was not only approved unanimously by all countries represented in the governance of cost association, but also was very much welcomed by the entire research and innovation community in Europe. To boost the contribution of cost to innovation, CIRT introduced the novel cost Innovators Grants, which has become a successful instrument. And the cost office in Brussels has praised Seat for being a great team player who never fell short in offering very generous feedback on the hard work done by the cost administration. Professor Kluting has also played a crucial and decisive role for Academia Europea, of which he became the president in 2014. Under his leadership, Academia Europea was able to secure a central position in the European academic landscape. And this was done by reinforcing its administration, notably through the Cardiff Hub, and by streamlining its governance structures, and by making Academia Europea a trusted partner of both the European academic community and of the European Commission. Key in this context was the decision taken by Academia Europea under the leadership of CIRT to step up its role in providing scientific support to policy making at European level by joining in 2016 SAPEA, the Science Advice for Policy by European Academies, which is a key element in the European Commission's scientific advice mechanism. Seert served as chair of SAPEA, the consortium for two periods, and thanks to his great diplomatic skills, was able to secure a consensus between the different European associations of academies and learned societies on many complex science policy issues. And let me be clear, for this task, his diplomatic skills were put to the test. A final word of praise regarding the accomplishments of Professor Kluting is related to his continuous interest for 
and support of younger researchers. From day one, CEIT reached out to the Young Academy of Europe and boosted the cooperation between Academia Europea and the Young Academy. And it is thanks to CEIT that the Young Academy was able to secure a place in SAPEA as well. So for all these reasons, and many more, which I was not able to mention due to a very time, limited time slot reserved for the laudation, Seat Kluting deserves the Academy's gold medal more than anyone else. I've spoken. Thank you very much. I would now like to call upon the Professor Clothing to enter the stage to receive his gold medal. To receive the uh, gold award today uh, means a lot to me, especially after this wonderful laudatio and the very warm and personal words by Robert Jan. To be part of this community, the Academy of Europe, which I joined in 1993, has always been a source of inspiration for me till the day of uh, Today, it's very close to my heart, this academy, because it is a bottom-up initiative of a group of people who decided that Europe needs an academy at a time of major changes in the European landscape. And uh, this uh, bottom-up spirit is there till, uh, till today. Uh, also, I'm very grateful to Academia Europea allowing me to synergize two of my passions. My passions for earth science, but also my passion for the European project. And it was in Academia Europea where many of the things that I have been involved in have uh, been born. So in the bottom of spirit, I like to uh, take you on a brief journey to System Earth and uh, probably it's not a surprise that also in the title there is the word bottom-up. I go indeed pretty deep, all the way to the core mental boundary. It's a depth of 3,000 kilometers. But I will uh, demonstrate you that this journey in deep time uh, and space is, uh, apart from dealing, let's say, with the deep earth, it might sound pretty remote to most of you, that it has also some very interesting spin-off to those who live on the Earth surface. I, uh, I have been very lucky that uh, I started uh, the, uh, my bachelor degree program uh, at a time where very important changes in the field itself took place. The classical view about, let's say, the inner Earth has always been we have a crust, then we have a mantle, a silicate mantle, and then below there is an iron nickel core. And, uh, well, there is heterogeneity in the crust. That's a very thin layer at the top. Think about the difference between what we have below the oceans and what we have at the continents. But below that, everything is the same. A pretty static picture. That all changed with the plate tectonic revolution, which uh, basically started exactly at the time that I entered uh, the earth science building in, uh, in Groningen, in the northern part of the, uh, of the Netherlands. Plate tectonics was born in the oceans. It was a byproduct of the Cold War. 
It was a byproduct of the uh, efforts, uh, particularly of the uh, countries in our part of the world and in the US, to map the ocean floor, also in the context of finding basically uh, safeguards for uh, the use of the nuclear submarines. And uh, it was a concept which very much focused on uh, horizontal motions of the plates. The basic idea is very simple. Hot material comes up from the deeper earth, is creating spreading ridges in the ocean, and after that the material is spread to the side, and at a certain moment when it's cool enough, it's uh, basically going down again. And the downgoing movement is called subduction. And in plate tectonics, in the first years, essentially the paradigm was all the deformation in the plate takes place at these boundaries, nothing in between. Of course, it also was a theory which was born at the oceans and focusing on uh, horizontal motions, which did not help much those who lived on the continents. And you can imagine, apart from ideological reason, that this was a theory uh, born basically uh, on uh, basically in the in the context of the U.S. Uh, and Europe, that in uh, in Eastern Europe, in particularly in the Soviet Union at the time, this theory was not so much welcomed because it did not help much to understand what's going on in. Uh, uh, in, in, in Russia, in the continental lithosphere. And it was only at the time of Gorbachev, when Perestroika and Glasnost came, that plate tectonics was accepted in the, uh, in the Soviet Union. A uh, very important point is that basically, uh, in probing system Earth, we have different tools. Drilling the Earth crust is limited to depths of around maximum 10 kilometers. All the rest of the information on the deep earth comes primarily from seismology. The basic tool to map structure and dynamics what's taking place in the deeper earth. And I was again very lucky that when I joined the uh, master program in Utrecht, that I could join a very active research group. I joined as a student the uh, group of theoretical geophysics headed by Nico Vlaar, and you see him standing amidst a group of his former PhD students, and I think you will uh, agree with me that looks to be a fairly happy crowd. And he initiated a very vigorous research program in geophysics with many PhD students, but also he involved the master students. And uh, one of my very first papers was uh, basically on uh, the core mental boundary. And I got a prize for it, essentially, uh, very nice, uh, basically, uh, as a stimulus. And uh, uh, that was all very nice. But uh, basically, what we found was a result we did not understand at all. We found, in a sense, inhomogeneity near the core mental boundary at depths of uh, 3,000 kilometers. And again, the tool was seismology. We used basically information from seismic networks operated by the UK Atomic Energy Authority stations, which were put there basically to monitor the nuclear earthquakes, the nuclear explosions in the former Soviet Union. And today, basically, we have a much better picture of what's going down at these uh, levels. And 15 years after I published this paper, this result came from seismic tomography, a completely different tool. You know, of course, tomography from the, uh, from the hospitals, but you can also use this uh, technique to map the inner part of the Earth. And basically, what you see here is a uh, depth slice from the Earth's surface, till a depth of around 3,000 kilometer, where you see the abbreviation C and B. And that stands for the core mental boundary. You see another layer, which is at a depth of around 700 kilometer. And that is the transition between what we call the upper mantle and the lower mantle. And in the early days of plate tectonics, the idea was that these downgoing plates would never go down deeper than the level of, nine, of 700 kilometers, where we have a phase transition in the inner earth. Today, we know from seismic tomography 
that essentially this level might be a graveyard for the downgoing plates, mapped here in blue by seismological tools. These are the zones where we have higher seismic velocities than a standard model, which we can explain by saying, well, this is a cold plate, whereas the areas in red stand for areas where we have lower seismic velocities, which we interpret to be areas where the temperatures are higher than the standard model has always predicted us. And what you can see is basically that there's a lot of blue going down also till depth of around 3,000 kilometers. So it looks like that we have two graveyards for the downgoing plates, one at a level of 700 kilometers, but another one at the core mental boundary. Beautifully explaining the enigmatic outcome of the research that I did as a master student, where frankly, although I got a nice prize for it, we had absolutely no clue about what this result was, uh, was meaning. It's a beautiful example of curiosity-driven research, but unfortunately enough, the answer had to wait quite a few years. And, uh, and a very important development, uh, and that has been speeded up recently enormously, is uh, the uh, field of computational geodynamics. And again, you see from this simulation, downgoing plates going down all the way from the Earth's surface to the core mental boundary. You see also areas of uprise of hot material, uh, but you see basically that this whole process of subduction is the key in the whole thing. Uh, the movement of the plates down into the inner earth. So, fascinating problem, still not solved, but it was the topic of my PhD. Wonderful uh, study. Uh, nature accepted it immediately as it stood, so that's wonderful, but it was a kind of negative result because I demonstrated basically that it was very difficult to initiate subduction, explaining also that today we hardly see it happening. So I was very relieved that uh, soon after I met one of the greatest geologists of our time, Peter Ziegler, at that time head of global geology of Shell, and he said to me, this is all very interesting, but with the same methodology, you can do maybe even something more significant. And that's go into sedimentary basins. Sedimentary basins, hosting mankind's main resources, of course, hydrocarbons, but also fresh water, and also the sites where we can drill for geothermal energy. And very important, holding the record of the interplay of geodynamics, tectonics, sea level change, and climate. And the Earth has a very good memory. It has no problem with Alzheimer's. It remembers very well what has happened in the past, and we can use that also to predict future. And you see here a map of the sedimentary basins of the world, and the sedimentary basins give us also the clue to the vertical motions. So not only horizontal motions, but vertical motions. The sedimentary basins bring us directly to Earth topography. And in a uh, review paper I published with Bilal Haq a few years ago, we made the point that uh, inherited landscapes are very closely linked to sea level change, are very closely linked to what we observe today. So another example of the memory of the Earth. And the driving force for a lot of this inherited landscape comes from pretty deep below the Earth. So that gave us also the uh, motivation to develop a uh, pan-European large-scale research program called Topo Europe. Topo Europe taking continental Europe and its margins to the adjacent ocean basins as a natural laboratory to investigate the interaction between the processes operating deep in the Earth on the surface and also in the atmosphere. And uh, if you look to this picture here, you see some uh, seismic tomographic cross sections till a depth of 600 kilometers. The areas in red are the areas where we have uprising hot mantle material, and the areas in blue are the areas where we have subduction, down thrusting of the lithosphere till uh, greater depths, and that's taking place in the Carpathians. That's taking place here below Crete, 
that's taking place in the Tyrrhenian Sea, but also in the uh, Gibraltar uh, area. So what you see is a beautiful example of heterogeneity at deeper levels. And this matters for the topography of the overriding plates. We have in Europe, in contrast to the paradigm of plate tectonic in the uh, first phase, where mountains basically are a byproduct of the interaction of tectonic plates, uh, particularly the Mediterranean, where Europe is meeting Africa. In Europe, we have also a lot of topography far away from the plate boundaries, like here in southern Norway. Very fascinating also here in Spain, a microcontinent with an average elevation higher than the average elevation of Switzerland. And we stayed away from this. But today we have the tools to reconstruct the evolving continental topography and to link it to what's going on at deeper levels. And uh, with this program, we uh, basically got uh, close to 15 million euro funding. Parallel to it, there was another program, Topo Iberia, which completely focused on Iberia itself, another 8 million. And altogether, we got 23 participating countries in the boat, enough funding to keep 60 young researchers off the street. And this community still exists. And I'm very happy that among the uh, members of the Young Academy of Europe, there are several of them who have grown up in this uh, community. So what is important also is, again, that Europe has a lot of topography, a lot of topography which uh, is a little bit enigmatic, but also that Europe is not exactly rigid. The, the paradigm in plate tectonics, first generation, is deformation is concentrated at the plate boundaries. Well, if you look to the distribution of earthquakes in Europe, that's not exactly the case. We have earthquakes far away from the plate boundaries. And that is a very interesting observation. Also, we have a very rich spectrum of uh, vertical motions in, uh, in Europe, where areas where we see Europe goes up, with a plus here in this picture, and areas that continue to go down. So differential vertical motions. And that is important also when we go a little bit deeper into what these earthquakes can mean for seismic risk. And of course, if you look to a seismic risk map of Europe, financed by the European Commission at that time, then you see, of course, a lot of red, and that means high seismic risk around the Mediterranean, but also in the Carpathians area, just very close to the city of Bucharest. But you see, it's not only there, it's all over. And what is interesting here, is also that if we go to uh, an area like the Rhine Rift, with the Rhine Valley, where we have a major concentration of infrastructure in Europe, you see the earthquakes like very much to follow this Rhine Valley. And what is also interesting to realize that uh, the Rhine Valley is also an area where we happen to have some nuclear reactors. And nuclear reactors like very much rivers because you need the water to cool them. But the rivers like very much faults. So there is an intrinsic relationship with that, worth to explore further. So I hope that it is not a surprise for you, let's say that Topo Europe was uh, born in this area, in a workshop organized by the Earth Science Section of Academia Europea, and uh, the actual organizer was David Coase. And this was a great moment because here it took place. Here we brought the community together uh, to pave the way for a next generation of earth science uh, research. And uh, in doing so, we uh, were standing on the shoulder of a number of giants. I already mentioned Peter Ziegler, but I like also to mention Carl Fuchs, Stefan Muller and Alan Green. Stefan Müller was the founding president of the European Geophysical Society, and I had also the great fortune to stand shoulder to shoulder with people of my generation and even a little bit younger. And all these people were members of the Earth Science section of Academia Europea. So for our community, Academia Europea, apart from being fascinating on, uh, let's say, general issues, has also played a key role in the community building 
in our own domain. So for me, these were two sides of the same coin. Top of Europe had also a number of what we call natural laboratories. After, let's say, apart from Europe as a whole, also some sub-regions where we could investigate some specific problems. And uh, I will not go through them all because there's no time for that, but I like to show you basically uh, some things that we develop for the North, the Atlantic Ocean, and the uh, uh, transition to, the, to Scandinavia. And uh, I like also to uh, show you something for an area which is not so far from the Kingdom of the Netherlands, and that is the Massif Central of France and the Eiffel region, both volcanic areas where our predecessors have actually witnessed the volcanic activity in the middle of the continent, which has always been an enigma for us to explain. So let me first show you this result, an ESC-funded project carried out by the seismology group in Utrecht. And uh, we all know ESC stands for breakthrough research, and that was certainly the case with this piece of work. You see here a depth slice uh, through the northern Atlantic and adjacent areas at a depth between 100 and 200 kilometers. Red is the area where we have a hot upper mantle. And of course, it will not be a surprise that you might recognize that this area is also in the lane Iceland. And uh, that's very fascinating. Iceland is a very interesting site, and Don can tell you uh, about what's going on in Iceland in terms of deep drilling for geothermal energy. What is also interesting is the side lobes of the plume. And one side lobe goes all the way to the mountains of southern Norway, far away from the plate boundaries, always an enigma. Here we have the explanation, because if you have a hot upper mantle, uh, it's buoyant and it wants to go up, and it's pushing uh, the overlying plate upwards. So, wonderful. We see also red at the British Isles, the western part, where we have volcanic activity, but we see also some red not so far from the Dutch border, and again, I mentioned that before, that is the Eiffel region, uh, where we have very recent seismic, uh, seismic uh, and volcanic activity uh, in the middle of the plate. And uh, what is interesting, also, that apart from looking inside the Earth, we can also, with these tools like seismology, we can also approach the Earth with information from space, with satellites. And here, Europe is a leader. A leader in developing the instrumentation and the ideas. And uh, this uh, figure here on the right-hand side is what we call the Potsdam potato. This is a figure which shows you the areas where we have a deficit in uh, density in the deeper Earth. And that's the area in the red. And that's, again, the Northern Atlantic, the area that I just showed you as mapped by seismic tomography. But also major parts of the Alpine Himalayan belt, but also areas where we have a lot of blue, like here in the Congo Basin and here in the Northeastern Indian Ocean, where we have an excess of gravity at deeper levels. Here we zoom in again on Europe, and again you see there is a lot of, uh, of red, which we interpret as areas not only of low density, but also high temperature. Areas uh, including this mega plume under Iceland, which comes up all the way from a depth of 3,000 kilometers, but also areas like the Anatolian Plateau of uh, Turkey and the uh, Pannonian Basin of Hungary and the Atlas Mountains uh, of northern Morocco. So, putting it all together, the inner Earth is not static. We have areas where the plates go down, the subduction zones, but we have also areas where plates uh, material comes up, uh, all the way from 3,000 kilometers, but also a lot of little plumes which are basically uh, secondary plumes which come up from the level of 700 kilometers. So it's a very dynamic process of downgoing plates, upgoing plates, completely different picture 
And then the picture, let's say that I started off uh, today with, with a static Earth, everything spherical symmetric, uh, and you have only to look into the crust to see a little bit of differences. Well, that is very interesting and very fascinating. And uh, what we realized more recently is that these plumes who attack the uh, tectonic plates from below, that when they come up under an ocean basin, they have a pretty boring expression, which we call a swell. If they come up under a continent, then uh, you get uplift, but next door you get downward motions of the, uh, of the plates. So they can not only produce topography, but they can also produce basins. And they can even lead to down thrusting of the adjacent plate uh, next door. And this is initiation of subduction. So for me, it was uh, very humoristic actually that 30 years after I left my PhD topic, that in a very indirect way, I came back to it with a completely different explanation. And I think that is funny. That's very interesting because we, did, we didn't look for this mechanism. We just found it as a byproduct uh, of what we were looking for, what is the detail mechanism of the interaction of this upwelling uh, and the overlying plate, and what can it do for topography at the surface. Well, more recently, we have further elaborated this, not only looking at the big plumes, but uh, also looking at what we call the secondary plumes, which are launched from depths uh, where we have the transition zone in the mantle at a depth of around 700 kilometers. And uh, these things have been discovered uh, in Europe first. And these are small plumes. That's why we call them baby plumes. Not because they are so young, but they're very small. These are not the giants that we found under Iceland, for example, or in the, in the Pacific. And uh, in a recent paper with a group of colleagues, uh, I uh, worked a little bit further on this, taking the observations from Europe, where they were initially uh, detected, but also with recent observations from China and Japan. And uh, we call this uh, paper fingerprinting secondary mental bloom. Don't have the illusion that you're standing here uh, uh, and standing here uh, together with Sherlock Holmes. We never had the idea basically to, uh, uh, to, to really uh, arrest the, the criminal, but uh, basically we were interested in what is the difference between these small ones and the big ones, and also driven by observations, we were interested in what does it mean for Europe? Because we have these things in Europe, where they were first discovered, and uh, these are very small. They launched from a platform at depths of 700 kilometers, and then they stick up like fingers. And uh, what is also interesting, that in some areas, they uh, basically make it all the way to the surface, and in other areas, they trapped. And in general, Europe is underlain by a hot upper mantle. So this is basically also the place to look for these things. And you can see that also again in this tomographic cross section, this time to a depth of 700 kilometer, where you see the downgoing plate under the Carpathians in blue. And next door, you see a big red area, which is the mantle under the Pannonian basin of Hungary. So you see also to create that depression, uh, at the back of the Carpathians, you need to do something with the mantle over depths of hundreds of kilometers. So you cannot separate this. And that's a very important uh, uh, conclusion. So when we look into these baby plumes, then I already mentioned the, uh, the Eiffel area. Uh, you see a plume with a very small diameter. Uh, it's about 100 kilometers, very small. But it makes it up all the way to the Earth's surface. We see here another example, this is from Southeast Asia, where you see a kind of arrowhead penetration of the lithosphere. And you see here another example of a plume which is already dying, where the basically uh, we missed the moment where it actually took place, we come a little bit too late, and this whole thing is basically leading to spreading within the crust and mental part of the lithosphere. And we did numerical experiments basically to understand 
this very intriguing different modes of penetration between finger shape, arrowhead, finger shape here, arrowhead there, and basically the next phase. So this gives us insights in the processes. First of all, help to explain why these things occur. Second of all, on a scale which is pretty close uh, to the field observations. Well, you might say that's all very nice, but uh, well, is it relevant? To our surprise, it was relevant because the findings of Topo Europe have basically provided the science base for a lot of subsequent research on geothermal energy exploration. And I was very happy to be involved in my, with my group and consortia partners, including the Dutch uh, Organization for Applied Science, in a large scale uh, EU funded project on enhanced geothermal energy research. And there our findings found a way. They provided the base basically for subsequent work and uh, also demonstrated, well, that there are certain areas where you have a better chance to do something meaningful than other areas. And these areas where we have a high heat flow, that means a lot of heat comes out of the earth, are depicted here in brown and in uh, yellowish colors. And you might recognize here Hungary, you might recognize uh, Western Turkey, you might recognize the Massif Central and the areas in the uh, Western uh, Mediterranean. So Europe is in good shape for this. And uh, geothermal energy is really on the move. Of course, it's very important in areas like Iceland, where it's so hot that you can do a lot of electricity generation. But you should not forget geothermal also for heating. And it's ideal for that. And we have the infrastructure because we know our subsurface very well due to more than 100 years of intensive geological and geophysical research, but also that because major parts of Europe have been met in great detail in the search for hydrocarbons. And uh, that information is there, can be used. So when we make a little prediction for, let's say, the uh, future of the cost <laughs> prediction for geothermal energy, and this was uh, already done uh, basically uh, a few years ago, you see that already today we can identify a number of areas uh, here marked in yellow and brownies where the costs are relatively low, but you see the perspective is even more brighter if we go a little bit further in the future. And you might also notice that in terms of the energy uh, transition, there's a kind of reversal in terms of the source for energy, because the areas which now host some of the major hydrocarbons are not the areas which are associated with a hot upper mantle and are not really the areas where one should go for geothermal energy. So in that sense, that's also good news for uh, our part of, uh, of Europe. Let me finish here by saying it's not only the uh, development of new concepts, we are also very lucky that the European Commission has funded a major large-scale infrastructure project which is called EPOS, the European Plate Observing System, and this is integrating distributed infrastructure because the different countries in Europe have often very complementary infrastructure. And in EPOS, we bring it all together, first of all, for probing system Earth, but also for dealing with issues like induced seismicity, unstable coastlines, and uh, other very interesting issues like carbon dioxide sequestration, and altogether a major development for, again, for our community. And the motivation as far as, let's say, the, uh, the basic science came from a large part, again, from top of Europe. So, for several reasons, one can say Europe is the place to be in our domain. And I have listed a few of these, but it's not only that. In the end of the day, it's all about people. And here, working with different generations of uh, researchers and building a community, I think that's the great fun. And uh, that has been, for me, a great source of fun. And, and again, uh, this, is, this teamwork is essential uh, to make progress in, in our community. And I'm very happy that uh, a major part of the community do this self-organization. They have fun, they learn from it, and they further develop. 
So I'd like to leave it here. Thanks again for the great honor and thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Sir, for this excellent presentation from which I learned a lot about the exciting things that happen beneath us. Is there uh, a short question? If I may ask them, what is the predictability with regard to earthquakes and volcanoes? Uh, is it possible to predict when this will happen? That's a very uh, uh, pertinent question. Let's say we have a good base for mapping the areas where these things occur. To predict them in time is a different issue because we deal with nonlinear processes. And that makes it very difficult to say tomorrow it will take place. In some areas, this is very a serious point, like the areas uh, in the Carpathians, where we have the process of a plate that goes down, but basically the lower part is breaking away. And that process is occurring 100 kilometers north of the city of Bucharest. So there's practically no warning time. Uh, and here again, I like to repeat the statement of Richter from the famous Richter scale. He said, earthquakes don't kill people. Buildings kill people. So here again, we need a very close interaction with uh, the engineering community, but also with the social sciences uh, community, how to handle this type of, uh, of situations. And again, that is also true for geothermal energy, same thing. Uh, because this price development that I mentioned here is not only related to basically advances in understanding the processes, but is also linked to advances in the drilling operations uh, themselves. Yeah. So I, I, I'm afraid I cannot give you, let's say, a direct answer like tomorrow there. But again, we know very well the areas to avoid. Uh, so thank you very much, Sir, and once again, congratulations to your well worked award. <laughs> I, and finally, uh, during this session, we come now to the concluding remarks and announcements of Building Bridges 2023. I leave over to Maria. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. It remains, remains for me to thank you all, the, aud uh, the audience, uh, the speakers, the chairs, the panelists, the deliverers of Laudatia. Uh, special thanks, of course, go to the Barcelona Hub and the Young Academy of Europe for co-organizing this wonderful uh, conference. Uh, the Board of Trustees had an important role in designing uh, and consolidating the the program, and of course, we had here uh, Monica McKay with her team to, to uh, uh, assist us what concerns the technicalities of the conference. Now, it is important for all of us to note that there is going to be uh, uh, issues that you wish to look at the website. So, the Cardiff Hub's uh, communication team has been interviewing many of you, and the interviews, of course, are on the website. And prior to the conference, the same team interviewed several people, and for instance, uh, Helga and, and Shankar. And uh, these interviews, uh, they have been uh, uh, turned into transcripts, and these texts are also available already now on the website. Now, it's a great pleasure for me to announce to you the next Academia Europea Erasmus Medal Laureate. And this is Professor Jean-Pierre Changeu from Institut Pasteur and Collège de France. Uh, he has been the leader in receptor research and neuroscience for half a decade. And he has uh, uh, agreed to deliver his lecture in the next conference. Uh, finally, I would like to welcome uh, the newly appointed uh, academic uh, director of the Barcelona Hub, Professor Jean Bertrand Petit, 
to our community. And I would like to welcome our newly elected treasurer, Professor Stephen Evans from Cambridge University. And finally, I would like to welcome our newly elected vice president, Professor Donald Dingwell from Ludwig Maximilian University, Munich. And he, of course, is also the academic director of our Munich hub. Now, Don, do I see you there? Yes, you're there. Uh, could I please uh, ask you to come up and close the meeting by announcing the next conference? Thank you. Thanks very much, Maria. Thanks very much, Madam President. Um, <clears throat> I'm severely tempted to launch into an hour-long lecture on the relationship between volcanoes and geothermal in Iceland. That's the cluting uh, effect, but I won't. I have a couple slides, however, if we could bring up the last presentation, because I have a much more sober task, but also a very enjoyable task to now tell you. Uh, you can take pictures or write down the notes. Soon there will be a website up that we will meet again in uh, Munich on the 9th, the 10th, and the 11th of October. Have no fear, the Oktoberfest will be finished on the 3rd <laughs> or the 4th. Actually, not yet decided. It's amazing. Um, and it's before semester, so we have very uh, good accommodation within the university. It's a Monday to a Wednesday. I hope that's convenient for most of you. Could we have the next slide? Or may I do it myself? So it will be most likely held in the main <laughs> building of the Ludwig Maximilians Universität, which is one of the uh, nicest academic buildings in Munich. You see it here on the bottom uh, left and right, and you see the area of town in which it's located, uh, also on the top. And if you have a sufficiently high uh, floor in your hotel, you can also see the mountains. Next slide, please. Or I do it myself again, excuse me. So we will have the uh, Audi Max, um, which you see on the bottom uh, left here. And it's a wonderful uh, room for our plenary sessions, which contains many details, many of you know it well, uh, built into the uh, construction, which are a great distraction if you start to fall asleep during one of the lectures which is being presented. That was a joke, okay. If, and on the upper left, uh, we also have the common area. It's area of uh, also of historical significance. It's the famous scene of the, of the protests of, uh, the students uh, uh, during the Second World War. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, history, tragedy, and success, and rejuvenation and rebirth associated with the University of Munich. And you can really easily appreciate it uh, when you come. And uh, this is just an area which will be just outside of the rooms that we will be using. This is probably where this, the ambiance under which we will hold our breaks and, and so on and so forth. And of course, there will be a president's dinner. And although it's not yet clarified, this is one example of where it may be. It's just a few blocks away from the university. This one is the famous Löwenbräu Keller. Uh, you know, every brewery in Munich, and there are many, has its own uh, festival hall. And so we are sure to have a very good ambiance for you to uh, feel comfortable in Munich. And we're working together already with two companies, one for the electronics on the left, the Congress service, and one for the uh, actual Congress Center uh, uh, company, which is within the Ludwig Maximilians Universität. So we're getting good prices and good advice. And uh, we have two representatives here, one my assistant and one from the company, the Congress Center company here, Frau Straubinger and Frau Pesochnia. And they've been here for the entire conference. So uh, they know what they're facing. And so the next formal steps are two. Uh, the financial plan is basically standing, uh, the, the expenses. Now we have to figure out how we're going to pay for it, but we're, on, we're in a good way. Uh, there will be significant financial support through the Munich Hub, and the Munich Hub is supported by the LMU Munich, by the Ludwig Maximilians University. And there will be a board meeting in Munich on the 16th of January, uh, plus a site visit where a lot of things will be uh, shaken out and fixed uh, to put us on the Zielgerade, as we say in German, the, the home stretch towards the meeting. And so, uh, I welcome you all to Munich next year. We've kept as our title, at least provisionally, Building Bridges in honor and respect to what's been accomplished here in Barcelona. 
in the spirit of continuity of this series, but of course with a very different flavor, starting with the way that we're presenting it at our logo. So put it in your calendars and you'll all be very, very welcome next year in Munich. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are very much looking forward to that. I think this concludes the um, session and uh, there will be buses at five o'clock to take you to the city hall for the um, uh, Barcelona Hypatia European Science Prize. Thank you very much. And let me also thank the organizers of this meeting for doing a wonderful job. Thank you.